Hello friends, it is day 244 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365. If it is okay with you, I'm actually going to go ahead and cover day 245 so I can try to get ahead by one day because we are getting back on a plane tomorrow night to go home so that my children can be around our family. So I appreciate your grace in that. If you wanna make a stop at day 245 once we reach it so that you have a lesson for tomorrow, please do so. Otherwise, it might be a long one, but don't be scared away. It is just because we're combining two lessons in one. My name is Kanoi. If you are new here to Bible study, we welcome you with open arms. We are so excited that you are here with us as we break down the Bible pretty much verse by verse, and we are on track to finish this study by the end of 2023. But if you are here, whether it be in 2024, 2025, just know that you are right on time. Otherwise, if you could help us out by giving this video a thumbs up and also make sure you're subscribed to the channel, hit the notification bell, and join us in our Facebook group. All right, let's get started into the word. Lots more to cover today in the book of Ezekiel. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. We lift you up today. We lift you on high for you are majestic. You are awesome. You are wonderful in all your ways. And we are just so grateful to be able to be your child today, to be able to study your word, to be able to sit in your presence and have this time. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the time, for helping us to carve it out so that we can be obedient to be able Able to learn more about you and to be in your word today. Lord, your kingdom come and your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And the fact that we believe, God, that your will be done and we are praying for it, we're going to believe for it. And when we see things happening, Lord, we're going to trust that you are sovereign and you are in control and we will not fear. Please forgive us of our sins. Lord, show us where we may have gone wrong, where we may have erred, that we may have not know. And I pray that you will show us how we can make it right. Please also help us to forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation. Please keep us from the evil one, Lord. We want to be able to serve you and you alone, so I pray that you keep our eyes fixed on you, forward and upward. We love you so much, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, here in chapter 18, Ezekiel is emphasizing the importance of personal accountability and responsibility. The word of the Lord came to me, what do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. So this proverb basically says that we are being punished because of what our parents did. And the Lord is like, oh, no, 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 no. You guys are not going to be lazy in your accountability and your own responsibility. You cannot blame your parents for what you have done or for what you are facing. And I think that this is so profound that the Lord had spoken this because in the past, God said that he would punish people from generation to generation, but that does not necessarily mean that he will punish them in their innocence. He's going to punish them because they will likely continue in the sin of their forefathers. And so God is saying, we're going to turn this proverb around right here. and We're not going to allow you to misinterpret it any longer. You guys need to understand that you have to take responsibility and you cannot blame your parents. You cannot say this is the way God made me or this is the way that I was raised because that is not an excuse. Excuse. We all have the ability to change. We all have the responsibility to change. And therefore, God is making sure that the people know that this is the case. Verse 3, as I live, declares the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. Now, when he says souls, he is referring to the totality of life, body, spirit, soul, all of it. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. If a man is righteous and does what is just and right, if he does not eat upon the mountains, meaning those idolatry meals, or lift up his eyes to the idols or give honor or glory to the idols of the house of Israel, does not defile his neighbor's wife or approach a woman in her time of menstrual impurity, which was wrong in this time, does not oppress anyone, but restores to the debtor his pledge, commits no robbery, gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with a garment, does not lend at interest or take any profit, withholds his hand from injustice, executes true justice between man and man, walks in my statutes and keeps my rules by acting faithfully, he is righteous. He shall surely live, declares the Lord God. 
So basically he is saying, if you are just, if you are giving, if you are honorable and you live righteously, you will surely live. And why is God so concerned about all of this? Well, not only are you responsible for the way that you live for yourself, but even more so you could see with all of the things that he listed here is that God is even more so concerned with the way that we treat others. And that continues today. The very uh, most important commandment is to love God and then love people, love your neighbor as yourself. So God, it, it is still very important to him today as it was back then for us to treat others right. If he fathers a son who is violent, a shedder of blood, who does any of these things, though he himself did none of these things, who even eats upon the mountains, defiles his neighbor's wife, oppresses the poor and needy, commits robbery, does not restore the pledge, lifts up his eyes to the idols, commits abomination, lends at interest, and takes a profit, shall he then live? He shall not live. He has done all these abominations, and he shall surely die, and his blood shall be upon himself. So, this is basically the opposite of the things that he was saying were righteous. This, this is considered abominations and wickedness, and therefore that leads to death, which the wages of sin is death. God is not saying anything different here than what he has always spoken. Now suppose this man fathers a son who sees all the sins that his father has done. So the picture that we're seeing here is that there was a man, and then they, he had a son, who then now has a grandson. So this is actually modeled. We're not saying that it's referring to them specifically, but it is modeled with Hezekiah, Manasseh, and Josiah. So we had evil ruler gave birth to evil ruler, gives birth to righteous ruler. So that's where we're at right now with Josiah. Now suppose this man fathers a son who sees all the sins that his father has done. He sees and does not do likewise. He does not eat upon the mountains or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, does not defile his neighbor's wife, does not oppress anyone, exacts no pledge, commits no robbery, but gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with a garment, withholds his hand from iniquity, takes no interest or profit, obeys my rules, walks in my statutes. He shall not die for his father's iniquity. He shall surely live. So we can see here that everything that God had spoken in the beginning about how you will be held accountable for your own deeds, not your parents, it's being spelled out here. As for his father, because he practiced extortion, robbed his brother, and did what is not good among his people, behold, he shall die for his iniquity. So while we may be affected by our parents' sin, we won't be responsible for it will only be responsible for our own. So this is the wise son here. Yet you say, why should not the son suffer for the iniquity of the father? When the son has done what is just and right and has been careful to observe all my statutes, he shall surely live. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. So this is not God saying, I will kill the sinner. But what he is saying here is that your sin will eventually kill you. So God sometimes will put an end to things, even to the lives of people, because he can see farther ahead than we'll ever know. And if he sees in the future that the road you might be going down is going to lead to your death, he may act in his righteousness and cut a life short so that in his mercy, he will allow you to live. Sin isn't bad because of the fact that it is forbidden. It is forbidden because of the fact that it is bad. Again, the wages of sin is death, not because God is giving us that payment for sin, but because sin will lead to that payment. Hope that makes sense. But if a wicked person turns away from all his sins that he has committed and keeps all my statutes and does what is just and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of the transgressions that he has committed shall be remembered against him. So again, full restoration, always available to anyone who is repentant and willing to turn back to God. And it's amazing because as we read through all this, this judgment in the book of Ezekiel, through the prophets, God always comes back to the fact that he is willing and he is going to restore. For the righteousness, oh, read that. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live? So God is saying, listen, 
I don't take pleasure in watching people suffer and watching people die. Rather, the opposite. Remember when Lazarus died and Jesus wept at the tomb? So even Jesus, as he walked this earth as man in flesh, he too was sorrowful at death, naturally so. So God doesn't rejoice in that, but he rejoices in life instead. If he didn't, he would have never sent Jesus. The reason why he sent Jesus was so that we could live. But when a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice and does some the same abominations that the wicked person does, shall he live? None of the righteous deeds that he has done shall be remembered for the treachery of which he is guilty and the sin he has committed for them he shall die. So basically, no matter how many righteous deeds that you do, if you do not repent of your sin, if you do not turn from your wicked ways, that righteousness is not going to cover you. It's not going to be enough to be the payment that you need in full repentance. Now, I don't want anybody to say, but I thought you said that all of our sin is forgiven, past, present, future, under the blood of Jesus. We've got to remember here that Jesus has not yet come. And so again, their responsibility different from ours in the sense that they don't have that covering of the blood upon their lives. And so they, on a daily basis, had to be repentant. We do too. I don't want to downplay the importance of repentance and making sure that you're walking a righteous life and a holy life and have your heart turned toward God because it's still as important today as it was back then. But I'm just saying that they did not have Jesus yet for that covering. And so they had to actively be in repentance, bringing the sacrifice, atoning for the sin, because he wasn't here yet. Yet you say the way of the Lord is not just. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? When a righteous person turns, he has done away from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. For the injustice that he has done, he shall die. Again, when a wicked person turns away from the wickedness he has committed and does what is just and right, he shall save his life. Because he considered and turned away from all the transgressions that he had committed, he shall surely live and he shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is not just. O house of Israel, are my ways not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? Therefore, and by the way, that was just a recap of everything he has been saying. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live. Can you not hear the urgency in the voice of the Lord where he is practically begging them, please turn back, turn to me, live, don't die, don't continue in that. I can see further than you can see. I know what the consequences are and I do not desire to see you suffer. He still calls to us with that same compassion and that same love and that same pleading. And he gives us all the desire and all the ability to be able to do his will but the thing is, is that we have got to partner with him to now work it out. It's kind of like when we want to be healthy. All of us want to be a little bit skinnier and healthier and want to have more energy. But it's going to take that partnership with that willpower to do it and get to the gym and eat a little bit healthier. If we don't do it, we're never going to go down that road to good health. So our faith is the same way. It's just like a muscle. We have got to work it out. We have got to partner with God and do the things necessary in order for our faith to be strengthened on a daily basis. Chapter 19 is a lament for the princes of Israel or the failure of the princes of Israel. There's two laments here. And when we speak of the princes, we're actually talking about the kings. And you take up lamentation for the princes of Israel and say, What was your mother? A lioness. Among lions she crouched. In the midst of young lions she reared her cubs. And she brought up one of her cubs. He became a young lion. And he learned to catch prey. 
He devoured men, and the nations heard about him. He was caught in their pit. We're going to stop here before we turn the page. The lioness here that we are referring to is a depiction of Judah or Israel. And her lioness, or one of her cubs, is Jehoahaz. And remember, he was imprisoned by Pharaoh Necho in 609 BC. He had a very short and evil reign, only a couple of months. So that is the first cub that we are talking about out of this lioness, or out of Judah and Israel. So he was caught in their pit, and they brought him with hooks to the land of Egypt. When she saw that she waited in vain, that her hope was lost, she took another one of her cubs and made him a young lion. So now we're speaking of Jehoiakim, who reigned from 609 to 597 BC. He was the one who gave the people false hope. He too was taken captive to Babylon. He prowled among the lions, he became a young lion, and he learned to catch prey. He devoured men and seized their widows. He laid waste their cities, and the land was appalled, and all who were in it at the sound of his roaring. Then the nations set against him from provinces on every side. They spread their net over him, and he was taken in their pit. With hooks they put him in a cage, and brought him to the king of Babylon. They brought him into custody, that his voice should no more be heard on the mountains of Israel." Your mother was like a vine in a vineyard. So again, we're speaking of Israel and Judah now being described as a vine. So she was once a very fruitful, she was a strong kingdom, especially under the reign of David and Solomon. So she was planted by the water, fruitful and full of branches by reason of abundant water. Its strong stems became ruler scepters. It towered aloft among the thick boughs. It was seen in its height with the mass of its branches. So basically it was put on a pedestal. Everyone could see the favor that was on the nation of Israel. She had a very fruitful past and this has a focus on their present distress because it's like she once was and we are no longer. And now we're gonna look ahead at also her future judgment. But the vine was plucked up in a fury. Of course, this happening by Babylon, cast down to the ground. The east wind dried up its fruit, that being Babylon, the east wind. They were stripped off and withered. As for its strong stem, fire consumed it. Now it is planted in the wilderness. So this is speaking of a spiritual wilderness of Babylon, because remember, the people being taken away into Babylon, Babylonians didn't actually treat the Israelites horribly. They were not like the Assyrians where they were cruel. So this is more of a spiritual wilderness that they are facing. In a dry and a thirsty land, and fire has gone out from the stem of its shoots. This stem of its shoots refers to Zedekiah, and their corruption and destruction actually came from within, from their own rulers, from their own people. And fire has gone out from the stem of its shoots and has consumed its fruit, so that there remains in it no strong stem, no scepter for ruling. So this is holding the leaders, the kings accountable for the fall of Jerusalem and Israel. So they are responsible for the condition of not only the nation, the land, but absolutely the people and their spiritual condition. And now chapter 20, Israel's continuing rebellion. This date is dated around 591 BC. And Zedekiah had sinfully aligned with Egypt at this point. And they are now wanting to know if Egypt is going to be able to save Judah from Babylon. So they're going to ask the question. In the seventh year, in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, speak to the elders of Israel and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Is it to inquire of me that you come? As I live, declares the Lord God, I will not be inquired by you. So they basically forfeited the ability to be able to hear God and his voice. And they forfeited the ability to inquire of him because they hadn't listened to him before. And they continued in their sin. So God is basically saying, I got nothing to say to you all. But of course, he is going to spend the next however many verses actually answering them because he's kind and merciful that way. Will you judge them, son of man? Will you judge them? Let them know the abominations of their fathers and say to them, thus says the Lord God, on the day when I chose Israel. Now in the book of Ezekiel, this is one of the only times that we see God speaking of Israel as the chosen one. So this is sort of repeating the covenantal terms, um, the fact that he had chosen them. 
I swore to the offspring of the house of Jacob, making myself known to them in the land of Egypt. I swore to them, saying, I am the Lord your God. On that day, I swore to them that I would bring them out of the land of Egypt into a land that I had searched out for them, a land flowing with milk and honey, the most glorious of lands. And I said to them, Cast away the detestable things your eyes feast on, every one of you, and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me and were not willing to listen to me. None of them cast away the detestable things their eyes feasted on, and nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Now, if we look back into the book of Exodus, it wasn't really told to us then that they had been committing idolatry in Egypt while they were there. We hear about it after when they get into the wilderness and they ask for or create a golden calf with Aaron, but it was not explained, at least to my knowledge, that they were practicing idolatry. Uh, But now we are told that they in fact were. So that kind of goes to show where the problems started. Then I said I would pour out my wrath upon them and spend my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. But I acted for the sake of my name. So he is vindicating his own righteousness here, his grace, his power, by defeating Egypt and delivering the people. It was all for his sake, for his glory. That it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations among whom they lived, in whose sight I made myself known to them in bringing them out of the land of Egypt. So I led them out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. I gave them my statutes and I made known to them my rules by which if a person does them, he shall live. Okay, time out. We got to take a pause here for a second because if it is saying that if you do these things, then you will live, some might say, wait a minute, that would make it a works-based faith, which we know that our faith is not works-based. It is grace-based. We know that we have been saved by grace and it is not by works where we receive that salvation. However, by doing these things and they will live is actually a faith-based works. So the more faith that you get, the stronger you become in your relationship with Christ, the more that your desire will be to serve him and to do the things that he desires. I don't know about you, but I know that's the case for me. Have you seen that as your faith grows, your desire for him and your desire to do things in accordance to his will and for him also grows? Because I have seen that the quality of my spiritual walk has been based upon the obedience to God. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statutes, but rejected my rules, by which if a person does them, he shall live. And my Sabbaths they greatly profaned. Then I said, I would pour out my wrath upon them in the wilderness to make a full end of them. But I acted for the sake of my name that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations in whose sight I brought them out. Moreover, I swore to them in the wilderness that I would not bring them into the land that I had given them, a land flowing with milk and honey, the most glorious of all the lands, because they rejected my rules and did not walk in my statutes and profaned my Sabbaths, for their heart went after their idols. So this is talking about that whole generation that completely missed out on the ability to inherit the promised land. Nevertheless, my eye spared them and I did not destroy them or make a full end of them in the wilderness, because of course the next generation was able to enter. And I said to their children in the wilderness, do not walk in the statutes of your fathers, nor keep their rules, nor defile yourself with their idols. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Keep my Sabbaths holy or hallow. Some of your Bibles might say hallow. So continually maintain the Sabbath that they may be a sign between me and you and that you may know that I am the Lord your God. But the children of Israel rebelled against me. They did not walk in my statutes and were not careful to obey my rules, by which if a person does them, he shall live. They profaned my Sabbaths. Of course, that being they profaned the ability to have that rest and where they were probably working on the Sabbath because they were so caught up in wanting more and more money. And therefore, they were trying to work on that day. And remember, the Sabbath rest is a symbol of God's covenantal relationship with his nation and his people. 
Then I said I would pour out my wrath upon them and spread, spend my anger against them in the wilderness. But I withheld my hand and acted for the sake of my name that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations in whose sight I had brought them out. So he's repeating this once again. Moreover, I swore to them in the wilderness that I would scatter them out more or scatter them among the nations and disperse them throughout the countries because they had not obeyed my rules, but had rejected my statutes and profaned my Sabbaths and their eyes were set on their father's idols. Now we know that this is partially fulfilled and actually ultimately fulfilled as they have been scattered and God brings them back into their land back in 1948. So this was in accordance to that covenant. And I don't know where I left off. Um, Moreover, I gave them statutes that were not good and rules by which they could not have life. And I defiled them through their very gifts in their offering up all their firstborn that I might devastate them. I did it that they might know that I am the Lord. Therefore, son of man, speak to the house of Israel and say to them, thus says the Lord God, in this also your fathers blasphemed me by dealing treacherously with me. For when I had brought them into the land that I swore to give to them, then whenever they saw any high hill or any leafy tree, there they offered their sacrifices and there they presented the provocation of their offering. Because remember, they didn't destroy the high places like they were told to do, but instead kept them thinking, ah, we'll be all right. They're not going to be able to tempt us, but because these high places were so beautiful and they probably became so part of their everyday life that eventually they kind of drifted into compromise, into going up there and saying, well, maybe it's not so bad to just come up here every once in a while. And that's exactly how sin happens. One foot in front of the other, one thing after the other, you know, it just continues to increase until you are completely gone and you know, you feel like you've been just sideswiped, but really you were the one who walked into it. So in these verses, we are going to hear about the rebellion of the people in the promised land. Whereas up here in verses 10 through 26, this was their rebellion in the wilderness. And now here in the promised land. For when I had brought them into the land that I swore to give to them, then wherever they, oh, we already read that. Okay, so they're acting like the Canaanites, the very people who left behind those high places. There they sent up their pleasing aromas, and there they poured out their drink offerings. I said to them, what is the high place to which you go? So its name is called Bema to this day. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, will you defile yourselves after the manner of your fathers and go whoring after their detestable things? When you present your gifts and offer up your children in fire, you defile yourselves with all your idols to this day. So they have this ongoing disobedience. It just continues generation after generation. And shall I be inquired by of by you, O house of Israel? As I live, declares the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. So if we want to be able to hear from God, the key point is that we have got to listen to him in the first place and be obedient to the thing that he is telling us. If not, he's not going to allow us to listen or hear from him anymore. It's not that he'll stop speaking, but we will no longer be able to hear. We'll have gunk in our ears. What is in your mind shall never happen. The thought, let us be like the nations, like the tribes of the countries and worship wood and stone. It all started with them wanting to be like the other nations. Remember, they we want kings like the other nations have. We want this, we want that. And, you know, we can't harp on them too badly about this. I mean, last night I had... I actually woke up to several text messages from my son who's asking me to get him Dr. Squatch soap and native shampoo and some kind of pomade that I've never heard of. And I just thought, where in the world are you learning about these things? Well, of course, he's in football and the boys bring certain kinds of soaps and shampoos and he uses them and is like, I need to have that too. I need to be like them. And this is typical. We all kind of went through this in one way or another. And so we can't put it too far behind Israel to act this way as well. 
You know, I mean, it's easy for us to be on the outside and be judgmental of this, but really we all are kind of like that. I mean, even when I see certain things, I started highlighting and taking notes like this because of somebody I saw on Instagram. You know, it, it it's one thing to be inspired by what you see. It's another thing to just blatantly want to be like other people and especially when they are walking sinfully. So that was the case for the nations that surrounded Israel and now they were falling into that sin or walking into it I should say. As I live, so this is God making a vow, declares the Lord God surely with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out I will be king over you. I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out from the countries where you're scattered with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. So he will have this direct encounter with them. As I entered uh, into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord God. I will make you pass under the rod. And this terminology refers to um, counting the sheep. They would have the sheep go under their staff and that was their way of counting them. And that's what he is saying here, that I'm gonna have this type of covenantal relationship with you where I will know you by name. You will be part of my flock. And I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. This happens partially under Ezra and Zerubbabel, but will not be ultimately fulfilled until Jesus comes. I will purge out the rebels from among you and those who transgress against me. I will bring them out of the land where they sojourn, but they shall not enter the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. As for you, O house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, go serve every one of his idols now and hereafter, if you will not listen to me. Sounds a little sarcastic here, but my holy name you shall no more profane with your gifts and your idols. So he's implying here that they were mixing his name with idolatry and he didn't want their divided or lukewarm hearts anymore. He's like, no longer will you guys do this. You're going to act one way behind closed doors and another way outside. No, you need to just Fix it right now. Make it right both inside and outside. For on my holy mountain, the mountain height of Israel, declares the Lord God, there all the house of Israel, all of them, shall serve me in the land. So here's number one of what God is going to do. He's going to return them to their land. There I will accept them, and there I will require your contributions and the choicest of your gifts uh, with all of your sacred offerings. So what I really should have done here was for number two, and if you want to make this correction, is restore the sacrificial system. Because I remember I mentioned that before, and I missed it as I was reading. It doesn't even need to have numbers on it, but I just was numbering it for the sake of numbering it. So I just don't want to forget that that is something he will do. As a pleasing aroma, I will accept you when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you have been scattered. And I will manifest my holiness among you in the sight of the nations. So he will have a revived relationship with them. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I bring you into the land of Israel, the country that I swore to give to your fathers. And there you shall remember your ways and all your deeds with which you have defiled yourselves. And you shall loathe yourselves for all of the evils that you have committed. So when they loathe themselves, they feel the shame of their sin, they will then renounce it. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I deal with you for my name's sake, not according to your evil ways, nor according to your corrupt deeds, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. So there will be this recognition of the grace and the sovereignty of God in this time. And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face toward the Southland, preach against the South. So that being facing Judah and prophesy against the forest land in the Negev. Say to the forest of the Negev, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I will kindle a fire in you and it shall devour every green tree in you and every dry tree. The blazing flame shall not be quenched and all faces from south to north shall be scorched by it. All flesh shall see that I, the Lord, have kindled it and it shall not be quenched. Then I said, ah, Lord God. So this is a passionate plea that Ezekiel is pouring out here. They are saying of me, is he not a maker of parables? So basically because they can't understand 
what Ezekiel is saying, or they can't comprehend that this is actually a word from God. They're basically accusing him of making these things up. Even if God says that he will be silent, he never will stop speaking. The thing is, is that he will go silent because again, we will stop listening, but it's impossible for him to be silent because his word is alive and it is active. So if you are having a hard time hearing from the Lord, This is possibly what is known as a loud silence because again, the word alive, active, it is constantly there for us to be able to answer every question that we might have. But we just might be the ones who are unable to hear, who are unable to comprehend and understand because of the very things that are within our hearts, within our ears and in our minds. And that may be the very thing that is keeping us from being able to hear from God. It is not that he is not speaking. And for those of you who want to duck out at this point to be able to take a pause, a breather, uh, please do so. This lesson will actually be for the next day here in chapter 21. This is for day 245. So now the Lord is drawing his sword. Okay, so I'm going to warn you here. These next two chapters, they're a little bit rough to get through because it's a lot of judgment and he ain't holding back. God is being very direct. He is being very vivid in his descriptions and it can feel a little... I don't know, like a little squeeze on your heart. That's how I felt this morning when I was reading. I was like, oh man, like this kind of hurts a little bit to try to get through, but you know, we just keep our eyes focused and we keep the hope alive of who Jesus is for us and what he is going to do for us and for the people. So the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face toward Jerusalem and preach against the sanctuaries. Prophesy against the land of Israel and say to the land of Israel, thus says the Lord, behold, I am against you and I will draw my sword from its sheath and will cut off from you both righteous and wicked. So this is going to show that every single person, whether righteous or wicked, is going to be affected by this judgment. Because when God is against, who can be for them? kind of opposite of what he actually says when God is for us, who can be against us. But the opposite is quite true. Their destruction at this point is imminent and everyone in the wake of that will be affected. Because I will cut off from you both righteous and wicked, therefore my sword shall be drawn. I will are drawn from its sheath against all flesh from south to north and all flesh shall know that I am the Lord. This was his whole purpose was to be able to restore the relationship with his people. I have drawn my sword from its sheath. It shall not be sheathed again. As for you, son of man, groan with breaking heart and bitter grief groan before their eyes. So he is telling Ezekiel here, listen, I need you to be sorrowful in this moment and to show them how important this is and how impactful this is because sin always leads to sorrow. So this is sort of an emotional upheaval happening here and it displays the broken heart of God. And when they say to you, why do you groan? You shall say, because of the news that is coming, every heart will melt and all hands will be feeble. Every spirit will faint and all knees will be weak as water. Behold, it is coming and it will be fulfilled, declares the Lord God. So this is showing the complete brokenness of the nation. And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy and say, thus says the Lord, say, a sword, a sword is sharpened and also polished sharpened for slaughter, polished to flash like lightning. So this sword here is referring to the Babylonian army and the fact that they are ready and that they are moving quickly. They are moving swiftly. Everything is going to happen quickly. Or shall we rejoice? Some translations say, or shall we make mirth? So basically this is, or should we instead be confident in the things that we thought were actually going to happen? So that false confidence. You have despised the rod, my son, with everything of wood, my son being Judah or Zedekiah possibly. So the sword is given to be polished that it may be grasped in the hand. It is sharpened and polished to be given into the hand of the slayer or Babylon. Cry out and wail. 
Son of man, for it is against my people. It is against all the princes of Israel. They are delivered over to the sword with my people. Strike therefore upon your thigh. So these two things, crying out and wailing and striking your thigh, those two things display great grief and sorrow. For it will not be a testing. Well, because they had already failed all the former tests. What could it do if you despise the rod, declares the Lord God. As for you, son of man, prophesy, clap your hands and let the sword come down twice. Yes, three times, in fact. So this is showing defiance, the clapping of the hands and the sword coming down. The sword for those to be slain. It is the sword for the great slaughter which surrounds them, that their hearts may melt and may stumble. At all their gates I have given the glittering sword. Ah, oh, it is made like lightning. It is taken up for slaughter. Cut sharply to the right. Set yourself to the left, wherever your face is directed. I will also clap my hands and I will satisfy my fury. I, the Lord, have spoken. So this is referring to the three Babylonian invasions that are going to take place. And in the end here, God is going to clap his hands, one in defiance, but possibly also to applaud the fact that his purpose is finally being revealed and being in taking place. The word of the Lord came to me again. As for you, son of man, mark two ways for the sword of the king of Babylon to come. Both of them shall come from the same land and make a signpost. Make it at the head of the way to a city. Mark a way for the sword to come to Rabbah of the Ammonites. And why the Ammonites? Because of the fact that they had formed an alliance with Zedekiah. And then Mark one on the way to Judah. So he's like, basically, I want you to have two signs, one pointing to Ammon, one pointing to Judah. Into Jerusalem, the, uh, the fortified. That didn't sound right. Into Jerusalem, the fortified. For the king of Babylon stands at the parting of the way, at the head of two ways, to use divination. So basically, the king of Babylon is going to refer to his spiritists and say, which way should I go? He shakes the arrows. So that's throwing those arrows up and kind of casting a lot. So whatever way that the arrows would fall, that's the direction in which he would go. He consults the teraphim. He looks at the liver. So the other two ways would be he would read the liver of animals by way of their shape and their color, or he would consult his idols. That was the teraphim. Into his right hand comes the divination for Jerusalem. So the signs all pointed to Jerusalem is what this is saying. To set battering rams to open the mouth with murder, to lift up the voice with shouting, to set battering rams against the gates, to cast up mounds, to build siege towers. But to them it will seem like a false divination. They have sworn solemn oaths, but he brings their guilt to remembrance that they may be taken. So just because that... Uh, king of Babylon is sort of getting this favorable answer or just because it is in line with God, it doesn't go to say that the fact that he uh, consulted with his spiritists or in this divination is right. Just because something happens, you know, in coincidence or it happens at the will of God or according to the will of God, it doesn't necessarily make the actions by which you got there correct or right. So that's what's happening here. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have made your guilt to be remembered in that your transgressions are uncovered, so that in all your deeds your sins appear, because you have come to remembrance, you shall be taken in hand. And you, O profane wicked one, prince of Israel, whose day has come, the time of your final punishment, thus says the Lord God, remove the turban, this referring to what the priest would wear, so this is the priesthood, and take off the crown, this being the kingship. So the priesthood and the kingship will both be removed. Things shall not remain as they are. Exalt that which is low and bring low that which is exalted. A ruin, 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 I will make it. This also shall not be until he comes, the one to whom judgment belongs, and I will give it to him. So I don't know if you caught this, but this very verse here is one of the most profound and prolific pointing to the Messiah, to Jesus. It is very similar to Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, the way that that verse actually pointed to Jesus as well in his coming.
And you, son of man, prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord God concerning the Ammonites and concerning their reproach. Say, A sword, a sword is drawn for the slaughter. It is polished to consume and to flash like lightning. While they see for you false visions, while they divine lies for you, to place you on the necks of the profane wicked, whose day has come, the time of their final punishment, return it to sheath, to its sheath. So this is fulfilled five years after Jerusalem was destroyed, and it is because of how they look down upon Judah in a haughty way. Again, speaking of the Ammonites here. In the place where you were created, in the land of your origin, I will judge you, and I will pour out my indignation upon you. I will blow upon you with the fire of my wrath, and I will deliver you into the hands of brutish men, skillful to destroy you. And you shall be fuel for the fire. Your blood shall be in the midst of the land, and you shall be no more remembered. For I, the Lord, have spoken. So basically, their fate is worse than anyone else. Because not being remembered is one of the greatest disgraces in this time. And now chapter 22, Israel's shedding of the blood. They are being held responsible for this. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, And you, son of man, will you judge? Will you judge the bloody city? So they're no longer being referred to as the holy city or the beautiful city, but the bloody city. Then declare to her all her abominations. You shall say, Thus says the Lord God, a city that sheds blood in her midst. So they're not even committing these uh, acts in the wilderness anymore, because that's usually what they would have done is to to shed blood in the wilderness where no one would see it. They're actually doing it in the city now so that her time may come and that make idols to defile herself. You've become guilty by the blood that you have shed and defiled by the idols that you've made and you have brought your days near. So basically you all have made yourself ripe for judgment. The appointed time of your years has come. Therefore, I have made you a reproach to the nations, a mockery to all the countries. Those I have made you a reproach Oh, no, those who are near and those who are far from you will mock you. Your name is defiled. You are full of tumult. So basically their hypocrisy is now going to be exposed and that will turn them to the ridicule of other people. And this continues today. You know, anti-Semitism still exists today. Now I thought to myself, man, I never thought of Israel as a bloody city or someone who was committing all types of murders. I knew it was happening there, but it never was described this way as a bloody city. Even though they weren't as cruel and they weren't shedding as much blood as people like the Assyrians, they are held to a higher standard because they knew better. And that's the same case for us. When we know better, we are gonna be held to a higher standard. That's why the Bible says that the teachers of the word will be held to a higher standard because you should be the very ones who know better, just like the priests back in this day. And what caused all this in the first place? Because bloodshed is a social sin. It all came from idolatry, which is a spiritual sin. It all starts within. It starts in our spirit, it starts in our mind, it starts with a thought every single sin. And the effect of that will be socially. It will begin to affect the people around us. So this is why it's so important for us to have a good vertical relationship with God so that our spirits are right and therefore we treat others, that we have those horizontal relationships that are good. Because keep in mind that our spiritual walk will always affect our earthly one. Verse six, behold, the princes of Israel in you, everyone according to his power, have been bent on shedding blood. Father and mother are treated with contempt in you. The sojourner suffers extortion in your midst. So we're hearing all the offenses now against them. The fatherless and the widow are wronged in you. You have despised my holy things and profaned my Sabbaths. There are men in you who slander to shed blood and people in you who eat on the mountains. They commit lewdness in your midst. In you, men uncover their father's nakedness. In you, they violate women who are unclean in their menstrual impurity. One commits abomination with his neighbor's wife. Another lewdly defiles his daughter-in-law. Another in you violates his sister, his father's daughter. In you, they take bribes to shed blood and you take interest in profit and make gain of your neighbors by extortion. But me, you have forgotten, declares the Lord. So these are the things that they are being accused of here and rightfully so, they have done these things. They took advantage of the poor and weak. They rejected God and his covenant with them, which ultimately led to un 
ungodliness and inhumanity. They murdered innocent people. They were committing idolatry and therefore immorality. They were wrapped up in sexual immorality and incest. And they also had a love of money. And of course, they have forgotten the Lord. And now we will see a cleansing process that God speaks of. Behold, I strike my hand at the dishonest gain that you have made and at the blood that has been in your midst. Can your courage endure or can your hands be strong in the days that I shall deal with you? I, the Lord, have spoken and I will do it. I will scatter you among the nations and disperse you through the countries and I will consume your uncleanness out of you and you shall be profaned by your own doing in the sight of the nations and you shall know that I am the Lord. So this is not God, you know, harming his people here. This is him actually freeing them from the grip of idolatry. So fiery trials never feel good. It's always going to hurt a little bit, but it can be purifying if we allow the work of the spirit within us and allow him to cleanse us. And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, the house of Israel has become dross to me. Remember dross is the impurity in metals like silver. All of them are bronze and tin and iron and lead in the furnace. They are dross of silver. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have all become dross, therefore behold, I I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem. As one gathers silver and bronze and iron and lead and tin into a furnace to blow the fire on it, order to melt it, in order to melt it, so I will gather you in my anger and in my wrath. And I will put you in and melt you. I will gather you and blow on you with the fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in the midst of it. As silver is melted in a furnace, so you shall be melted in the midst of it. And you shall know that I am the Lord, and I have poured out my wrath upon you. So again, the fiery trials, what we're speaking of here. So first we started with the cleansing. Now we're speaking of the purification process. And what was once precious as Jerusalem is now being burned and considered dross and worthless. So this is a really sad picture. And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, say to her, you are a land that is not cleansed or rained upon in the day of indignation. So remember the abundance or even the absence of rain is usually associated with obedience and disobedience, according to Deuteronomy chapter 28. The conspiracy of her prophets in her midst is like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They have devoured human lives. They have taken treasure and precious things. They have made many widows in her midst. Her priests have done violence to my law and have profaned my holy things. So the very ones who were supposed to be set apart, they were supposed to be living holy lives. They were instead motivated by money and they had become corrupt. They have made no distinction between the holy and the common, neither have they taught the difference between the clean and unclean, and they have disregarded my Sabbaths so that I am profaned among them. So while they should have been actually glorifying God, they are instead profaning his name. Her princes in her midst are like wolves tearing the prey. So the kings or the rulers and leaders should have been the ones who were shepherding their people. And I just watched a really interesting video yesterday of the uproar in Hawaii, in Maui specifically, with the leaders. And one of the things that was being spoken was, you work for us. You guys are supposed to be protecting us. And I'm not trying to speak politically here by any means, but what I'm saying is that was the case with their rulers. They were supposed to be the shepherds, the one who cared for the people. And that is supposed to be the case for government and for you know leaders in the community. They're supposed to work for you. They do as public servants and they're supposed to protect you and help you and help build you up. You know, they're, they're there for your good or they're supposed to be anyway. And that was the case here, but instead they're tearing the prey, shedding blood, destroying lives to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have smeared whitewash for them. So they have basically minimized sin by covering it over like, oh no, it's good. Like this wall here, we made it with cardboard, but we're going to just put a little bit of whitewash or some, you know, some contact paper over. It's going to look like it's made out of cement blocks, but really is not. Seeing false visions, divining lies for them, saying, thus says the Lord God, when the Lord has actually not spoken. So they're saying things to people just for the sake of them hearing what they want to hear and probably so that they can be liked and given favor by the people as well. 
The people of the land have practiced extortion and committed robbery. They have oppressed the poor and needy and have extorted from the sojourner without justice. And I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall. So a wall was supposed to provide strength and security and stability. So he has sought for a man who would give them this strength and security and stability and stand in the breach before me for the land. So someone who will stand in the gap that I should not destroy it, but I found none. So sadly, there were no prophets, no priests, no politicians. Every single person had gone astray at this point and also led others to go astray as well. So now there's no one to stand in the gap for them. They don't have priests to be able to atone for them. They don't have prophets to be able to speak the word of the Lord to them. They don't have rulers to be able to help guide them in their everyday living. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. I have returned their way upon their heads, declares the Lord God. So they have no one in the end to help lead them back to God. Now I stopped here and said, wait a minute. What about Ezekiel? I mean, he is writing these very things. He's hearing from the Lord. What about the other prophets? Well, what this is more so referring to is the fact that the people are unable to be led by anyone at this point. So even though Ezekiel might be righteous and even though he is standing in the gap, he has the ability to be able to intercede on behalf of the people, it's useless at this point. He will be rendered ineffective to be able to lead the people because they are unwilling to receive that guidance. They don't want to be guided. They want to live how they want to live. Again, they aren't listening to what the Lord had spoken to them and they have no intention to. And this just leaves me so grateful for Jesus, even more so today, because we don't need people who will constantly fail us to be the ones to give us that strength, to be the ones to help guide us, to be the ones who will stand in the gap. Because guess what? Jesus is the ultimate wall builder. He's the ultimate strength, stability, security that we need. We don't need to find that in anybody else. People will always fail us and Jesus won't. He will always be there. He stands in the gap for us. He intercedes on our behalf. He stands at the right hand of the Father. He's like our attorney. When we get to heaven and stand before the Father, and he's gonna say, you know what? I died for her. I shed my blood for her. I know her. Welcome her home. Even in the midst of all of this doom and gloom being spoken, we still have that hope in Jesus today. So we thank you so much, Jesus, for being that for us today, being that hope, being our strength, our security, and our stability. When the world around us is rocking and rolling, the winds are blowing, the fires are happening, oh God, you are stable, you are unchanging, you are still good, you are still on the throne. And so we just come back to you, Lord God. We focus on you because the world, people, they're going to be saying all kinds of things. There's going to be all kinds of conspiracies. There's going to be all kinds of doubt. So Lord, help us to focus our faith on you and not in people. Because if we do that, if we focus on people, God, we're going to be so confused and left so empty. And we're going to be so riled up on the inside and full of anxiety. Nobody wants that, Lord. So will you cleanse us of that now? Will you wipe away all of the worry, all of the anxiety, all of the dirt or the pilikia, which is a Hawaiian word for problems that might be within us. Oh God, will you wipe it away, wash it away. Thank you so much for your blood, Jesus, that was shed on that cross for our sins. We ask for your forgiveness. We repent of our ways, Lord God, and we turn to you. That's all you have ever wanted. So we are here, God. We say we are here for you. Our lives are open and surrendered before you, Lord, to do what you want to do and to have your way. May we never turn back again, oh God. Will you strengthen us from the inside out? Help us to stand a little bit taller and to walk with a bold faith today, oh God. Lord, I pray that you will protect people, that you will protect our land, that you will protect our nation, that you will give us more grace and more time to be able to get people saved, Lord, and turned back to you. Thank you, Jesus, that you stand in the gap, that even when I have gone astray, Jesus, you call me righteous. You clothe me with those robes of righteousness. You say I am forgiven. You say that I am accepted. I'm so grateful for that today, Lord, and I pray that your people are able to feel your love today, your loving arms wrapped around them and comforted in this time, God. 
We love you so much and we thank you for this word, for this time, for this community. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I wanna give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna go after I die, but I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer I'm gonna put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came you died and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them, and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.